Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Have you ever watched a televangelist and noticed that many of them on television today will tell you that all you have to do to make your journey to the eternal realm and to go to heaven is just simply exercise faith in God. Or that is, if you want to go to heaven, just fall down where you are right now and receive the Lord Jesus in your heart. Now, all of that sounds good on the surface, but the question is, is it true? Did Jesus ever say to fall down right where you are and receive me into your heart? No, he did not. Does the Bible even hint at such a thing? No. Now, I know that probably is going to upset a lot of feelings, and uh, maybe a lot of people may be disturbed by that. But this program, Give Me the Bible, is all about truth and giving you the Word of God in its pristine beauty. So don't turn off the television. Don't move the channel. Stay right where you are for our presentation this morning, Can Faith Save a Man? And Faith Alone. We're going to go to Brother Stephen Gumpert right now to help us understand a little bit more fully about what salvation really involves, Stephen. These days, you can order just about anything online. So I went online and I looked for a specific pair of shoes I was desiring to have. I searched them. I said, I want a pair of brown shoes. I want them in my size. And so I got to the checkout and I had my shoe size and I had the pair exactly how I wanted it. And I ordered it. As soon as it arrived to my home, I opened up the, ba the box and I was looking forward to having those pair of shoes. When I opened them up, they were brown, but they weren't the right shoe size. That's why I did what any normal person would do. I'd say, oh, you know, they're the right shoe and they're brown, but they don't fit. I guess I'll keep them. No, certainly I sent them back and I got a new pair of shoes. When I think about this attitude, we need to understand that God's truth and God's faith of his word, we have it very specifically. God specifies what faith is. And so this morning when we look at faith is and what it is, I want to look at what faith is not. Certainly we look at the aspect in the religious world today that faith and belief are oftentimes used interchangeably, but we need to make a distinction that faith is not just belief. And if in the world today they say that just having faith is enough for salvation, then when we use those two terms combined, James 1 and verse 19 tells us that even the demons believe and tremble. Now in my mind, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't compute, because if demons believe and belief is just faith and faith is all that's needed, then I have demons and angels singing together. I have demons and angels, and that just doesn't make sense to me. Faith is not just belief, but it's also just not trust. It's not just trust, although trust is a big part of that. Sometimes when we trust, and I would spend uh, times with my brothers, I would do a trust fall. Now, if I didn't catch my brother, I would have it difficult to be able to trust them again or for them to trust me. Can you imagine serving a God you could not trust? This morning, when we look at this idea, Abraham is one who certainly trusted and believed in God. And we see that it wasn't until after he trusted and believed and had faith and worked with it that his faith was made complete. James 2 and verse 22 tells us that Abraham was justified uh, not just by works, but with faith and works. It says in verse 22 that you can see the faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect. Well, Stephen, thank you very much for those good words, and I appreciate you kind of going in the back door there with that, the idea that faith is not certain things, and it really isn't. Uh, but we want to know this morning what faith is. <laughs> what, what in is entailed when we say that we must have faith in God. And we're going to go to Barry Cowan right now. And uh, Perry, share with us uh, what the Bible actually says about faith and tell us what it is. 
Well, that's the only place we can find out what it is. Go to the Bible. Give me the Bible. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, I know you've heard that passage many times. Maybe simply put, the biblical definition of faith is trusting in something that you cannot explicitly prove. You believe there is a God. That's good that we do. There is a God, but we, have, we accept him by faith, and we accept his word by faith. The Hebrew writer is telling us that faith has become the reality of the things that we hope for, the things that we pray for, the, the, the substance of what we pray for. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 21, uh, it was in the 22nd verse, he said, whatsoever things you ask in prayer, you will receive. If you have faith, now a lot of people want to leave that last phrase off, but Jesus didn't leave it off. He said, if you have faith, you'll receive the things that you ask for. When God answers our prayers, we receive the substance, the, the, the reality of the things we had hoped for, the things we had prayed for. And that, in turn, provides evidence of things not seen. It gives us confidence that we can expect to receive those things that we've not yet seen because we've not yet received them. So we can have the things that we hope for and we can have evidence of the things we've not yet seen. All of us, all of you in our listening audience need to have faith. Why? Because without faith you can't be saved. For God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him has faith in him should not perish. Without faith, the Christian life cannot exist as God intended that it do. Jesus said, I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. John chapter 10 and verse 10. And then the Hebrew writer tells us that without faith, chapter 11 and verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Don't you want to please God, Dan? Well, Perry, thank you, and certainly all of us want to honor our God, we do. But you know, when you hear all these erroneous doctrines being perpetrated in the name of Christ, it's almost as confusing as the Build Back Better plan, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful to know that we're paying almost $6 for a gallon of gas? Doesn't that make you feel good? Doesn't it make you feel good that we have illegals that are uh, crossing over the border of Texas and coming into the United States illegally? And isn't it wonderful to know that we were once oil independent and all that's been shut off now, but we're building back better. <laughs> Praise God. Well, you know, uh, that's confusing, isn't it? It is. When interest rates are higher, stock markets lower, morality is out the window. That's a little confusing. But what does the Bible really say about God's grace. You know, so many people are so confused about the grace of God. And we're gonna call them to the Jerry Monhala now to tell us a little bit about that. Thank you, Dan. We know as we look about the grace of God and, and our faith, we understand that grace is what God does and faith is what we do. And so we couple these together. And so in coupling these together, we are ne neither saved by grace alone or by faith alone because the two are coupled together along with other acts of obedience that God tells us to do through faith. Let's look at Titus chapter 2, verse 11 in particular. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And what do we learn from this? What does the Bible say about grace? It's the grace of God. We know that that grace is that free gift of God that he's given us. It's grace of God, this free gift by which all men are saved. Isn't that what it says? The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. If we're saved by grace alone, then why is it all men are not saved? Because all men do not believe, is it? 
So you see, grace, God's part, has appeared to all men. That free gift has appeared to all men. But all men are not saved. We read at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, when we read about grace and faith also, for by grace you are saved. Absolutely. The grace of God has appeared to all men. By grace are you saved through faith. So you have grace coupled with faith. Well, what is faith? Faith is doing what God says to do. That's faith. It's just not believing there is a God. Faith is doing what God says to do. By grace are you saved through faith. Now, what does God say to do? Well, God tells us different things depending on who you are. Hebrews chapter 11, God told Abel to offer a sacrifice. He told Noah to build an ark. He told Abraham to go into a land that I'll show you. He, he said to, to Abraham also, offer your son Isaac. But what does he tell us to do? By faith, let's just look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. They said, verse 36, men and brethren, what shall we do? They asked that question because they could crucify Jesus. Peter gave the answer in verse 38. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins. Are you obedient, acting in that faith which God has given you to do? Have you repented and been baptized? Now back to you, Dan. Well, thank you, Brother Jerry. And uh, we are impressed by the intelligent remarks that have been made this morning about uh, faith and what the Bible really teaches about it and it, what it teaches about grace as well. One of the things Brother Jerry mentioned a moment ago is the fact that uh, uh, we are saved by grace through faith. Now, we're not trying to negate the fact here on this program that faith is an essentiality to our salvation. We understand the importance of it. And uh, we're going to ask Brother Barry Haynes right now to, to emphasize that and uh, give us passages that uh, tell us how important faith really is in this salvation equation. You know, faith, is, as we've talked about today, is, is vital. It's impossible to please God without faith. One must believe that he exists. But how does one come to faith? In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, Now faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You know, some of the most sad times in the scripture, some of the sad times we see in Bible history, come from times when people don't have any word from God. You know, the only way we know anything about God is he tells us about himself. He, he lets us know. He informs us. And those times when people don't have that word, we see them in misery. Think about uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, where it talks about, it says, word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. People were, were trying. They were, they were in misery because God wasn't speaking to them. And, and Amos chapter 8, verses 11 through 12, it talks about the famine that would come on them. Not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the word of the Lord. The psalmist writes in Psalm 74, verse 9, we see no signs. We no longer hear any prophets. You see, you can't have faith in something you don't know anything about. We don't believe in nothing. We believe in something. We believe in something because it has been revealed to us. We believe that message of God. God has shown us himself. Now, we don't understand or fully see God. We have to trust in him. But God has told us about himself. He has presented himself through his word. And that is how faith comes, that word of God. And we see that over and over throughout conversions in, in the book of Acts. We see those people who hear a message proclaimed to them, and they take that message and they hear it. They don't just have it pass over their ears but they understand it. And because that understanding comes, it drives them to action. What shall we do? How many times do we see that in the conversion stories of those who are saying, what shall we do? What must I do to be saved? Uh, how can I learn unless someone guides me? In other words, there are people who are longing to hear the word of God so that they can have the faith in him. Those people, when they heard that message, they didn't just let it pass over their ears, as I said, but they took it to their hearts. And when they did so, it changed their lives because faith comes by hearing. And once we hear that message, then it's our job to respond to it. 
Well, Brother Barry, thank you very much. And uh, you know, all of our speakers are doing an excellent job this morning in sharing with us uh, the Word of God. And what this program is really all about is giving you the Bible. And by the way, we've been doing this for the last 33 years through the airways, giving you the Bible, the truth. And we appreciate so much those of you who write us, who call us, to express your interest in our program and for all the supporting congregations, we're so thankful and grateful to you as well. You know, Jesus taught, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Sometimes people say, well, we're saved by faith, but baptism doesn't enter into it. And we're going to ask for the buddy Ray, is that true or does baptism really play a big part in our salvation experience? Thank you, Dan, and certainly I want to answer that question through Scripture. We know that in order to be placed in that saved condition by Jesus Christ and God our Father, that it is so essential and necessary that we obey the gospel of Christ, and we do this ultimately by being baptized for the remission of our sins. Acts chapter 2 and the establishment of the church tells us that, that those that were baptized for remission of their sins were those that were being saved, and they were added daily to the Lord's church. So yes, baptism for the remission of our sins and a total commitment to Christ and to God the Father is essential for our salvation. But once we're baptized, Dan, there's something else that becomes necessary and essential, and that is to immediately begin to live an obedient and faithful life to God. You'll find in Scripture in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, that we're told that we also should walk in a newness of life. You see, when the old man of sin is dead. When we raise from that watery grave of baptism, we are now to walk in a newness of life. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the apostle Paul says that those of us that are in Christ are a new creation. So once we've been baptized, once we have been saved through the power of our God, then we must immediately begin to serve him, to walk in the light as he is in the light, to faithfully become a child of God. I want to draw your attention, if you have your Bibles, to Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, as they're writing to the church in Smyrna. In verse 10, Jesus says these words. He said, Be thou faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. You see, there's the key. Once I'm saved, once I'm baptized, then I must be faithful until the day that I leave this earth. We find the great apostle Paul was certainly faithful until the day he died. And I want to close my portion this morning with some verses from 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you have your Bible, beginning in verse 6. Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. You see, the Apostle Paul knew he was about to leave this earth, but he said he had kept the faith, he had run the race, he had finished and fought the good fight. He said, finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteous, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but all those who love his appearing. Well, buddy, thank you. We're indebted to you this morning for uh, giving that clarification, if you will, uh, about faith and about baptism into Christ. And if you've not been baptized into Christ, it's time for you to act upon your faith. And we'd be happy to assist you in doing that if you give us a call or uh, write us uh, at the addresses that will be appearing momentarily. So, uh, thank you again for being a part of our telecast today. I want to go to Brother Chris Groder right now. And uh, Chris, just how important is it for us to be faithful to the end? Couldn't I say that, hey, I've had faith and once I'm saved, I'm always saved? Is that really true or is that a bunch of nonsense? That's a great question. And there are ways to be saved, but you have to to do something, you have to apply your heart to God's wisdom and to the study of His Word and to the practice of God's Word. And when you do those things, you will never fall, so says Peter. But there are some things we need to understand and acknowledge in Scripture. In John chapter 6, after Jesus gave that great I am the bread of life speech, you remember Jesus knew in Himself that His disciples complained about it. He addressed that issue. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that did not believe and who would betray him, according to John 6 and verse number 64. 
And from that time, many of his disciples walked back or went back and walked no more with him. And he told his own 12 disciples, will you also go away? And Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus taught in another place. It's recorded in Luke the 8th chapter in verse number 13 as he interprets his parable of the sower. He describes the rocky soil and he says, they are they that fell on, um, on the rocky ground. They're the type of people that when they've heard, they receive the word with joy. Sounds really good, doesn't it? They receive the word with joy, but they have no root, which for a while believe and in a time of temptation fall away. There were people like Demas who forsook Paul, having loved this present world, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 10, implication being that he fell away, at least for a time. Judas, of course, by transgression fell, Acts chapter 1, verse number 25. There's a host of Old Testament examples, those who became idolaters in Acts chapter, or in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 1. Some of them, 23,000 people because of sexual immorality fell in one day says that are those that tempted Christ and were destroyed by serpents. Um, Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 and verse number 1, Satan had filled their heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Both of them, when questioned, they lied and fell down dead. Hymenaeus and Alexander, uh, Paul had to deliver to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Hymenaeus had had spread a, a rumor that the resurrection was already passed and was overthrowing the faith of some. And, of course, their message was like a cancer. All of that to say that we can fall away. We can choose to remain faithful or we can fall away. Back to you, Dan. Well, that is precisely true, Chris. And if uh, any rational individual would read the Word of God, they would know that without any question at all that our faith must be true and secure and our relationship with Christ must be secure. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you can always be saved because you can fall away from the grace of our God who is in heaven. And many have fallen away. You know, the pandemic has caused many to fall away from God. Uh, they once were very faithful members of the Lord's church. They'd come and worship with the body of Christ, but now they'd rather sit home in their pajamas and watch it on TV or on the internet. Let me tell you for sure that this place program should never take the place of you going down to the church house and worshiping God. Never should it. Read the book of Hebrews 10 where the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are doing and some are doing it. Let's go to Joe Hancock right now. And uh, Joe, uh, is it possible that our names could really be taken out of the Lamb's Book of Life because of our unfaithfulness? Dan, it absolutely is. You know, uh, Paul had written at one point to the Galatian church. He'd been there, established that congregation. And the letter he writes back to them after they were established uh, in Ephesians, or excuse me, Galatians chapter 5 at verse 4, he says, You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Now, in order to fall from grace, you must at one point in time be in grace or within grace. These folks were trying to go back to the Old Testament law to be justified or for their righteousness. And Paul says, you have fallen from grace. You have become estranged from Christ. Now, when we talk about a divorced couple or a couple that is preparing to be divorced, in this life, we talk about them being estranged. They're no longer together. So just because at one point somebody names the name of Jesus as their Lord, and when I say that, let's assume that through the obedience to the gospel they did that. Jesus is my Lord. I confess my past sins. I confess Jesus as, as Lord of my life and the Son of God. I repent of my past sins. I want to change my life, and I need to be baptized to wash away my sins. That's the proper calling on the name of the Lord for salvation. Same thing Ananias told Paul in the book of Acts. What are you waiting for? Arise now and calling on the Lord and be baptized to wash away your sins. It's the same way now. And in Acts 2 and verse 47, the Lord adds those to the church daily who are being saved. But there are scriptures, Dan, that point to us uh, that some can fall, as Paul said, from grace. 2 Corinthians 5 at verse 15, 
who no longer live for themselves, but for him who died then rose again. He's talking about that Jesus died so that we who accept him as our Christ by obedience to baptism, to the gospel, should no longer live for ourselves, but live for him. If, and he goes on to say in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 and down through 23, if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. Saying that tells us that there is the possibility of being taken away from the obedience and taken away from the faith. Uh, Hebrews 5, 9, I think this is the, this is the best clincher in all this discussion. Jesus having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Uh, to turn away from obedience is to lose salvation just by that one verse. Dan, Hebrews chapter 5, 9 sums up the story. Got to be faithful to the rest of your life. And to that, I would say a hearty amen. And Joe, you did an excellent job in wrapping it up there for us and helping all of us to understand that it's not just saying I'm saved, but it's remaining very faithful unto God. If you have questions about this program, or you want to call us, you may do that, that uh, number that appears throughout the program. Uh, you want to contact us by mail or email, be sure and do that. I'm Dan Manuel, and I've been your host today and moderator right here on Give Me the Bible, and we hope that uh, you'll encourage others to watch this program with you each week at the same time, right on this same channel. And so until next time, I'm Dan Manuel saying thank you, and may God bless you, and join us next week for Give Me the Bible. Sing the sweetest song of all.